this is the last talk which uh, holds you back from your lunch, and uh, we want to make sure it's going to be worth it. So, before we start, uh, I want to know how many of you have not heard about Open Fire. Raise your hand. Everybody. Must be somebody. <laughs> Everybody. So it's a, it's a good brand. Good. Uh, Tony, uh, this this whole thing started in uh, 1970 on a bench in Regent Street, in Regent yeah. Park. Right? <laughs> What happened? What happened? I, I, I was at London Business School, and I'd, um, I'd been there for about a week. And, and I was an engineer before I went there. I, did, I, went, I was at Warwick University and did engineering. And I worked in the car industry for a couple of years. And a week after I'd started at the business school, I'd, I went over to the park and sat down on a, the sun was shining on one of the benches. And I sat down reading, reading a car magazine, as engineers do. Um, and I'd been there for five minutes, and this very attractive young woman walked by, looking for somewhere to sit down and read Tolstoy. I mean, what a, what a combination. And she sat down on the other end of the park bench, and I picked her up. And one year, one year later to the day, we got married, and um, that, was the, that was my Regent's Park connection. That's how we met your co-founder? Yeah, we didn't know we were going to go into business together at the time, but... And uh, you decided to go and travel? Yeah, a couple of years later when I graduated from the business... Now if you go to business school, you come out and you have 50,000 pounds of debt. You know, and you've got to get a job with a big pay That's true. paycheck immediately to pay that off. But it, it was different 45 years ago. And Maureen and I decided we'd, we'd have a gap year. The, the word gap year hadn't been invented. But we decided to have a gap year, and we did it by, we bought an old car. 65 pounds we paid for this car. Wow. It, cars were cheaper then. And we, we thought we'll just set off and we'll drive as far east as it goes, and it'll be, it's cheap enough that if it breaks down, we'll just park it by the roadside and walk away from it. And we drove across Europe, and we drove into Turkey, and we drove across Turkey into Iran, and we drove across Iran into Afghanistan. And we drove this 65 quid car from London to, Af to Kabul in Afghanistan, where we sold it for a five pound profit, um, which, was, which was a good thing to do. And we, we carried on, and eventually we ended up in Australia, and we, which was pretty much where we'd planned to arrive. Uh, the only thing we hadn't quite planned, we, we planned to arrive with enough money to you know, set ourselves up and work there for a few months and come back to London. And we actually arrived in Sydney. We hitchhiked into Sydney, and the last ride dropped us off. And Maureen, my wife, said, OK, Tony, we made it. How much money have we got left? And I put my hand in my pocket, and I pulled out 27 cents. And that, that was all we had. We had 27 cents. You were not worried about not having money? Uh, we were a little bit worried, yeah. I had a camera, and I got $25 for the camera. And you know, things were cheaper in those days. And Maureen got a job in a cafe that, that afternoon. So, you know, we, we, were, we were okay. But then while we were living in Sydney, and we decided to stay for a year, not three months, while we were living there that year, so many people said, where did you go? How did you do it? Can you sell a car in Afghanistan? These sort of important questions that we thought, someone needs to do a book about this. You know, there, there's a demand for that, that information. And we, we both had full-time jobs, but we sat down and put together the first Lonely Planet guidebook, and that was the, that was the start of Lonely Planet. That was, that was, it was born. Now, you told me earlier that uh, uh, you gave a talk at a business school, and uh, there was this article in The Economist where you need two things to be an entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, opportunity and paranoia. So the paranoia and opportunism, and you know, well, the, it, it was opportunism, you know. That, that, at that point, well, obviously, you know, the internet hadn't been invented. Laptop computers, computers hadn't really, now, computers took filled whole rooms. They didn't. Um, they weren't something you had in your own house. So all that that opportunity, that way of doing things, wasn't there. And there weren't any of the guidebooks. Rough guides came along five years after us. Yeah. So we were. The opportunity was there. And the other thing this article said: you need two things: opportunism and paranoia. And yeah, you do have paranoia. But it's. it's with any business, you know, the early days of the business are always, oh my God, how am I going to survive this week? And it's not so bad when there's just you. But then when the business sort of starts to go and you've got a few people working for you, I remember so many times we'd get to Thursday night and we'd think, oh Jesus, we have, we've got to pay everybody tomorrow. You know, and if you, you can't pay yourself, okay, you don't eat for the weekend. 
There might, there might be a couple of eggs and some stale bread in the fridge, but... This is true, but there's also one other paranoia which I was thinking about when I was thinking about Lonely Planet and your journey in 1972 from London to Australia uh, through land. Uh, how do you decide to go and... Uh, it's okay to go from the UK to, to France and from France to Germany, but you mentioned countries like Afghanistan and... Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, how do you get the courage to, to go there and not be afraid of what's going to happen to you then? Well, you know, one of the things that anybody traveling finds out is that places are they're never as bad as the media makes them out to be. You know, there are people who like to hear about things going wrong and disasters and, you know, and they're, okay, you know, people, things do go wrong, but they only go wrong occasionally. You know, most of the time, everywhere you go, people are wonderful. Last year, I, I, you know, we did the hippie trail, as it was called, driving from London to Afghanistan, on up to, you know, on to Pakistan and India and up to Kathmandu and down through Southeast Asia. That was the hippie trail. Well, last year, I did the opposite. I did the Silk Road. This uh, is so impressive to me, <laughs> isn't it? It was great. Well, I, I joined uh, some people I knew in Aus I live in Australia part of the year. And some people I know there, one of them said, I'm, I'm going to drive to London next year. And I said, really? What are you going to drive in? He said, I'm going to drive in a 45-year-old British sports car. He said, there's a bunch of us, and we're all, we've all got MGBs. And I said, wow, that sounds really good. He said, well, we've got one more space. If you want to go out and buy an MGB, you can join us. And it is. I did. Well, you know, there's lots of MGBs. They made loads of them. And they, was, they were good, sturdy British cars. Yeah. Made, in Abingdon, just outside Oxford. Um, nothing, nothing happened, nothing worked. Oh, and they long. broke down all the time. They got, we, had a, we had a couple guys who really knew how to fix them. Okay. But you know, we went, through, we went through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Kyrgyzstan. We were in China for two months, and everybody was wonderful. Yeah. Everywhere we went. I, you know, one of the funniest little incidents, we were in China, and everywhere we stopped, everybody wanted to come over and look at the cars and sit in them. And this young Chinese guy got in the car one and he's there, you know, change gear. And then he looks at the door and he says, a window winder. I've heard about those. I've never seen one of those. <laughs> you know, he's a, a generation in China. Yeah. You know, cars, they all have electric windows. There's story. no car there with a no. window winder. Yeah, the, this is the, the fun part where you just go and travel and all of us probably love to travel. Now, let's talk about the business part. So you happen to stumble upon this big opportunity where people didn't hear about those countries uh, you traveled to, through. It was about 96 pages, you said? The uh, first book, yeah. All of Asia in 96 pages. And you wrote your, basically your notes, right? In yeah, the book. yeah. And uh, how, how hard was it to <laughs> just have the book in your hand and, and start to sell it? Uh, how did you do it? Well, you know, we just, you, you went out, and I mean, I'm, I'm not a salesman, but I, I, I think with any business, the thing you've got to have is passion. Yeah. You know, you've got to really believe in what you're doing. And, you know, I, and I think, I mean, most people in tech businesses, they love tech. You know, that, that's, their, that's their passion. And if you don't have the passion for what you're doing, if you can't convince yourself about it, how are you going to convince anybody else? That's correct. But on the first book, you didn't make any money. You just uh, uh, didn't make much profit. You didn't lose money either, right? No, but, you know, we, we soon, we, the books did start to sell. And I, I remember when we did our second book, which was a, after we'd done that first one, which was an accident, we didn't, yeah. we didn't set out from London to travel to Australia and write a book about it. We just set out to travel and have fun, and we did have fun. Mm -hmm. But then we, when we decided, let's do a second book, so we bought a motorcycle in Australia, and we set off, and we, we traveled around Southeast Asia for a year. And then we sat down at the end of that year in a little hotel in Singapore, and we, we, we sat in this hotel for three months and put the book together on this little table. Yeah, and and this it was is you and your wife? My wife and I, yeah. I, you know, she was typing out things, I was writing them, I was drawing the maps. And it, I said, again, you know, this is before computers, so it was a, yeah. a manual typewriter. Um, but you know, we, we did that first book, and I, I still remember we, we printed it, we only printed 5,000 copies. I, I had to, we were running out of money, I had to go back and get it going to get more money to print more of them. But I went into a bookshop in Singapore, and the biggest bookshop in Singapore, and I thought, you know, these guys are going to buy, they'll buy 20 copies at least. Uh, and I'm telling them, you know, Singapore's the, the, the ground zero for all of these backpackers who are going to be turning up. They weren't there yet, but they will be turning up soon. And the, um, the guy in the shop, I thought, he'll, he'll buy it. 
at least 20, maybe you'll buy 50. And he got the order form out and wrote the name of the book down, turned it around and pushed it across the table to me and he'd bought a thousand. Wow. You know, and I, I was, you know, when your head's set up for 20 and you've suddenly got an order for a thousand, so 20% of that first print run was sold in one bookshop in Singapore. Nice. Did it change somehow the way you saw uh, the business of writing books and selling them? Yeah, because the, you know, the first great trip we did, and I think I, I, we, we were both in our, Maureen was 21, I was 24 or something. You know, you, you do these trips when you're young yeah. and they have this enormous impact on you. You know, you're, you're s discovering things for the first time. And that was a trip, the, the trip was just for fun. And then the second trip, the trip was to do a book and, you know, it, it was going to be the best book ever seen on Southeast Asia. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and at that point, 74 was when we were traveling around Southeast Asia. You say to an American, you know, go on a holiday in Southeast Asia, and they say, no, that's a place where it's a war. Yeah. You know, it's not a place to go on a vacation. So, you know, it was, it was um, a fertile field. It was a new area. Yeah. And when you decide to start hiring people into the company and helping you out with, uh, with the business? Well, we, we, it really was just the two of us for a while. And then we had a, a woman who was a single mother who brought, brought our little kid to uh -huh. the... We, did, we, didn't, we didn't have an office. We worked out of the second room in an old house. And, uh, but then we pretty soon, people... It was amazing how when the first couple of books got out there, then people came back to you and said, hey, I really liked your book. You know, I, I, it was the sort of travel that I like to do. And I've just been living in somewhere or other for a year, you know, and I know that place really well, and I could write a book about it. And we uh -huh. said, go and do it. <laughs> you know, come back with the book and we'll publish it. And you were not afraid of, of uh, losing the magic of your own touch on the books? Yeah, you, you, I mean, you, that that's, would be the paranoia. But the thing was, we were doing something that, you know, appealed to people with a certain mindset. And the people who wanted to work with you, they had the same mindset. Yeah. And, you know, as the business started to grow, and we did have, you know, real employees who you had to pay every Friday, uh -huh. but they'd, they'd come to you because they'd heard something about it and they really wanted to work with you, yeah. you know? It was great. I, you know, I, we had so much fun with that business for so many years, right till today. You know, I, I still bump into people working with it today who said, you know, it's a great place to work. Yes. Can you tell us, share with us some, some early business mistakes you did? And if you were to do it again, you wouldn't do that? You know, I, if I look back, the, probably the biggest mistake we, we made, and it would have made life a lot easier in the early days, is we didn't value what we were doing enough. You know, I, 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 books these days, I still do buy books on paper, but more often I download them, the digital yeah. version. And I don't know, what are they, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, or whatever. You know, those, those early books we did, they were one or two pounds. You know, and we had a book that was, Two pound ninety-five, and we could have made it three pound ninety-five, and it would have made no difference to the sales at all. Uh -huh. You know, people they wanted that information, and you know the the fact that it was another quid more expensive, they would have still bought it, yeah. and it would have made a big difference to how much money we had at the end of. The, I look back at the, the early couple of years, and every single thing we did, we could have made it. The one pound ninety-five could have been two pound ninety-five. The three ninety-five could have been four ninety-five, and it would have made no difference. To the, well, it made more difference to the money we got. That's true. So we undervalued ourselves uh -huh. in the early years. And uh, looking at the brand, you know, now Lonely Planet is a brand which is known all over the world. Yeah. How did you uh, help uh, the brand to grow so fast globally? Well, you know, it was, I, I've often said it wasn't like a dot-com business. You know, these businesses that somebody starts it one day and then they've gone public for a billion pounds the next. Yeah. It wasn't like that. Our, our business was more like the, the snowball that rolls downhill. But at first, you've got to keep pushing it and pushing it, and then it starts to roll, and before you know it, it's going downhill and gathering speed. And we did, that happened with the people working for us. Yeah. You know, someone would come in to interview me, and they'd say, how many employees have you got now? And I'd say, oh, we're at 20. And someone would say, Tony, actually, we took the 25th or 30th last week, yeah. you know, and it got to, we'd gone beyond 50, and I would say, oh, we got to 70, and they'd say, no, it's 100. You know, we, I didn't realize how fast it was growing. But it, you know, it was a name that, that people love, and I, I love the fact, we, you know, we see it in the English language, you know, it's, in, it's big in England, it's big in Australia, in America, the English language, but it's just as big in other languages. I, I was in Italy over the weekend, and Lonely Planet is by far the biggest name in guides and travel in, in um, I, I say, I, I do, a, do a talk in a bookshop in Italy, 
I get a bigger crowd than I would in uh, Waterstones in London, yeah. which is really nice. And the other place where Lonely Planet is really popular is China. Okay. And it's because you know, young Chinese are sort of, they're where we were 30 years ago. You know, 30 years ago, young Brits or young Australians or Americans, they were you know, getting out that first big trip from home, the, the gap year thing, the backpacker thing. Well, 30 years ago, the Chinese weren't doing that. They weren't allowed to travel out of their home city. Now they can, yeah. and they've got a real passion to go out and travel. And Lonely Planet's doing really well in China. And I, so I, I was in China last year on that Silk Road trip, and I did talks with people in, um, in Shanghai and in Beijing. Yeah. And it's just wonderful seeing this enthusiasm of young people. You must be really proud. Now, when it, talks to, when it comes to funding, did you self-fund the whole company? We growth? did, bootstrapping it, I think. You bootstrapped good. it? Yeah, because, you know, if I, I remember you sort of, you, that, those days, if you go into a bank and, you know, you say you're doing a book on travel business and their mind is saying France or Italy or something, and you say, no, we're doing Pakistan and... Um, Thailand, you know, the, Thailand, as I say, was still the, the war winding down in neighboring, Bangla, in neighboring Vietnam. It wasn't, a, it wasn't the tourist destination that it is today. Yeah. So we, we couldn't have got money from a bank. Uh -huh. And it really was one book paid for another. And, and for years, you know, we, I never had any money because any money we made, we just shoved it straight back into doing another book. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if someone said, yeah, that's enough money to buy a new car, I'd say, no, that's enough money to do, send someone to a country we haven't covered before and do something else. Yeah. And I love doing it, so you know, it didn't hurt at all. So you love doing it, and now you love traveling. Uh, how do you balance this, this work-life balance? Uh, you, you were traveling and writing business books uh, or tra travel books about this. How often do you, do you take a break to go and travel somewhere? I, you know, to, well, today, we, we sold the business. It's 10 years ago now, yeah. so I've been out of the business. Although, as I say, I still work with the Chinese office, the London office. Whenever I'm there, you know, I meet with these people. And I, I guess they must like meeting with me, but they don't say stay away. Um, but uh, even when it was, you know, the business, I, I loved doing it. You know, I would rather have gone off and worked on another book than gone on a holiday. You know, it, it always felt like a holiday. And I, I still do travel a lot. I, I do. One of the things we did with the business is in the, towards, not towards the end, well before we left, we set up a foundation. We thought we're, we're making money a lot of books in the developing world, we should put some of that money back into it. Yeah. Well, when we sold the business, we couldn't say that someone buying it, you're buying a business, and by the way, you've bought a philanthropic foundation as well. So a lot of the money we got from selling it, we put into setting up the foundation outside. And my daughter helps to run it. My daughter goes to more places in Africa than I do. But um, just a couple of months ago, I was in Bangladesh visiting the refugee camps there from the... Uh, all the Rohingya refugees have come over from Burma. Yeah. And um, it, it was Anita Rodik with The Body Shop. She set up this um, foundation that helps put schools into refugee camps and things. Cool. And we support that now. Yeah. So I was going in with this guy who was building the schools to look at the schools they were building. So I, I do that sort of thing. Um, I do business. You know, I spoke at London Business School last night. and. Start That's your alma mater, right? That's your yeah, I went to London Business School, school yeah. And yeah. They, you know, business schools, you know, people go to business school and get an MBA and they go out into consulting and banking and you know, all these things. When, when someone goes out and sets up a travel company, it's much more exciting for the business yeah. school. So, you know, they, they do like me at London Business School, which is nice. We have a couple of minutes left. What I'd like to know about is uh, talk about the future. And we can still feel you have the passion for traveling and for Lonely Planet. Where do you see the future of Lonely Planet? Uh, because we had a chat uh, backstage and you mentioned that you also, when you travel, you download most of the Lone Planet guides into your iPad. So yeah. it's changing. How much do you see this changing and how much do you think Lonely Planet will uh, survive this, this big change as, as a winner and keep Well, they're, they're doing the fine at the moment. You know, they're, they're doing, they do a lot of digital stuff. You know, there's a, there's a city guides app which has over 200 cities that yeah. it's free. You know, you can get it on your night, and it's really good. I'm, I'm really impressed with it. I'm, I'm impressed with a lot of digital stuff. I'm impressed with how good it is, and it doesn't cost you. Yeah. you know, that, that, that is amazing. But people still, you know, and I, I may get the books more often digital than paper, but I still, I still get the paper ones as well. Yeah. And, you know, and I still love using them. And the thing about a book is that the, the battery never goes flat. Well, the battery, paper doesn't go flat, and your, your tablet it can. But, um, you know, you, you're not out of Wi-Fi range. 
You know, you can't be sitting there thinking, I, I want to find a restaurant and there's no Wi-Fi. But you know, the book, you open it up, there it is. I'll, yeah. I'll go and try that one. Uh -huh. they, they still work really well. So I, I think, you know, there's, it isn't like a new technology totally kills the old one. Both of them can work together. Yes, it's complementary. Now, when, when it comes to uh, building a company, you, you know now uh, a lot of things which uh, our upcoming founders don't. Do you mentor any, any people or how do you, or do you try to, to give back to, yeah, to you know, other people? Yeah, I'm, I'm, people, <laughs> people all the time you know, call me and say, you know, I've got this idea for this great digital startup in the travel uh -huh. field. Can you, you know, and I, I say, look, I am not an expert on this and I, I, I wouldn't believe my own advice, but you know, I'll have a coffee with you and talk about it. Uh -huh. And it's funny, the, you know, and I've got lots of little things I'm involved with, and the, the only sort of successful business that I'm, I wouldn't say I'm mentoring at all, but I, I just, I love what they're doing, and um, they, they constantly show me their new product. Uh, it's these bunch of young guys in Australia, and um, they started a, a drone, they, they started a flying drones, okay. and they had a shop, you know, selling drones, but then they started making their own. And they started making bigger and bigger and bigger drones. And their most recent drone, it was used for um, the last Johnny Depp Pirates of the Caribbean. It was used for Thor Ragnarok. Okay. It, was used for, it, it lifts um, Hollywood cameras, and it'll lift two cameras so they can film 3D, cam, 3D you know, movies off the wow. same drone. You could, you could fly a small child on this drone. You know, it, it is just wonderful, and every time they've got a new one, they phone me, Tony, come and look at this new drone. It's going to become a flying car one day. And they you know, it's all, it's beautifully made. It's all machined out of aluminium and um, titanium and carbon fiber. It, it just, yeah. it looks wonderful, but it's a one-off. And they were, I remember, they were at a drone thing in America a year or so ago, and um, various drone manufacturers were there showing their drones, and their drone was bigger than the Boeing drone. Oh, wow. yeah, and that was really, I thought that was great. These young guys, you know, making something that's better than Boeing. Yeah. Tony, before we finish, uh, one question. Give us two tips uh, for upcoming founders, uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, w what is the, the best advice you would, you would offer them uh, when they're starting a company and trying to make it, uh, uh, make it work? I, I think we, we said before, passion, you know, passion. You've got to be doing something that you love and you believe in. And then, you know, believe in what you're doing more than, the, I, I think if you sit there thinking, how much money am I going to make? You know, what's the, what's the bottom yeah. line saying? You're stuffed. I agree. You know, the, 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 if, if what you're doing is really good, that bottom line will work out. And if it doesn't work out in the first years because you made the things too cheap, well, you'll catch up with that a bit, a bit further down the line. I couldn't agree more. Passion is the most important thing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Tony Wheeler, the founder of Lonely Planet. Thank you.